Some of us forgot where we first met him. But I challenge you today, listen to these babies. Pray with these babies. Sing with these babies. Listen for the voice of the Lord. Don't listen for my voice. Maybe you might not like me, but I'll tell you that. Didn't come here to see me. I didn't come here to see you. I came here to see Jesus. So don't let your personal feelings keep you from going to heaven. Maybe you will stand up. We will receive these babies. Reverend Beecham's chocolate babies. This morning, and the service shall go forward.
I will be reading Psalms 27 verses 1 through 4. Please rise. Responsive reading, everybody. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom do I fear? When evil warriors come at me to devour my flesh, these are my enemies. Foes themselves stumble and fall. One thing I ask the Lord. Altogether, one thing I ask the Lord is I seek to dwell in the Lord's house all the days of my life. Give these babies a hand of encouragement. It is not easy to stand before you guys, and I'm not seeing no smiles, so I know what they feel.
this time, we're going to ask the ushers to come forth as we prepare for the benevolent offering. If you're visiting with us for the first time, this is not our tithe and the general offering, but this is the offering of help. Hearts and hands, prepare to give. Father God, it's another day that you've given us another opportunity to share. Lord God, we ask that you bless each hand, bless each heart, bless each home that's represented in this building this morning. Lord God, we ask that you use these monies for the kingdom building, oh God, that your name is never silent in this house of faith. We love you. We trust you. We believe you. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, uh-huh. 
leaving us so we can come forth with the announcement for this morning. Next Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. Service will be held on Duke at the regular time, 11 o'clock. Pastor is requesting the entire congregation wear white in honor of this sacred service. Pastor Beach will render the word at Blanche Memorial Church on Wednesday, June 14th at 7.30 p.m. Pastor would appreciate the support of his members. Effective June 18, 2017, Sunday service will begin at 10 a.m. through August. Sunday school will begin at 9 a.m. Final chapel night for the summer will be held on fourth Wednesday, June 28, 2017 at 7.30. Please come out and support your brothers and sisters in Christ. The Maranatha Sisters in-house retreat is taking shape. Scheduled for Friday, September 15th at 7.30 and Saturday, September 16th, commencing at 8 a.m. Still time to submit your ideas and suggestions. The next meeting will be June 1st at 6 p.m. Please come out and join in with your Maranatha sisters for a renewed closeness, healing, and reconciliation. Applications will be distributed next Sunday. All Bible study classes will be suspended for July and August and resume in September following Labor Day. Have a safe and joyous Memorial Day. We want to say a special happy birthday to Sister Erica Mills. worship the Lord with us this morning. Amen. In this house, we praise God. We ask that you praise God on the level of where you need him to meet you. Amen. We hope you have a safe return home and come and visit with us again. Yes. If you do not have a church home and the spirit of the Lord lays it upon your heart at the hymn of invitation, please come forward Give our pastor your hand and guard your heart. Maranatha, let's say another good morning to them. Amen. Amen.
we have visiting with us this morning. She's one of our own. Come home to celebrate her birthday. Deaconess Lily, Man Lily Cannon, please stand up. This is look. Hey, I'm sorry, you know. This is, she's a sister to the Cannons, so I'm just gonna throw Cannon in you. God bless you. It's so good to see you this morning. That same pretty smile. Good to see you, and you have a happy birthday. God bless you. Amen. At this time, we're going to give you two minutes to shake hands with somebody you have to shake hands with. Or however, whatever. It's fellowship time. <laughs>
to find and support black businesses in their area. Um, so I have to commend uh, Maranatha Baptist Church for your dedication to supporting black businesses and to really being in our community and making a difference. Um, so I started Official Black Wall Street about two years ago. And during this time, I had learned about the original Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, now, for those of you who aren't familiar with this neighborhood, I suggest that you read up about it because it, it's definitely inspirational. Now, this to this day was the most prosperous black neighborhood in our history. Um, during this time in Tulsa, Oklahoma, this was in the early 1900s, um, but there was the Jim Crow laws. And so they had no choice but to create their own black businesses. They basically took lemons and made lemonade from it and it became very, very prosperous. So in this community, they had everything from black-owned pharmacies to black-owned movie theaters, anything you can think of. And it surely became the most prosperous black community in our history. So one thing that stuck out to me was the fact that this community reminded me so much of my own. I grew up in Bedside. Um, <laughs> and one person. <laughs> And the best side that I grew up in is very, very different from the best side that's there now. It's not as brown as it used to be. Um, and one thing that stuck out to me was the fact that we had, although it wasn't all black-owned businesses, we had a lot of staple black-owned businesses in our neighborhood. And a lot of those businesses had to close down and move out because of gentrification. And so for me, that really hit me. And it made me think that even though you know, we live in these neighborhoods and we think we own them, we don't have ownership of it. Come on now. Not when we're so easily removed from it. That's right. So from that point forward, I said, you know what, I'm going to go out and support as many of these businesses as possible to prevent this from happening. And that's how Official Black Wall Street started. Um, there are a couple of stats that I found after I did a deep dive into black-owned businesses that were really, really startling. Now, for one, in the black community, our dollar only circulates for six hours. Now, just so you have something to compare it to, in the Jewish community, their dollar circulates for 20 days. In the Asian community, it circulates for a month. So I'm going to go back again. In the black community, our dollar only circulates for six hours. Doesn't, not even half a day before it leaves and enters someone else's neighborhood. So there we have more money pouring out of our neighborhood than we have coming in. There was another stat I found that said that um, although we have a, a, a buying power of $1.1 trillion, less than 1% of that goes to black-owned businesses. So I'm going to flip it. So although we have a buying power of $1.1 trillion, 99% of that money is spent at other businesses. So we're not even investing in ourselves. So for me, that was a huge issue and something that I felt like we needed to do more of. We have to create more wealth in our communities, and we have to do that with supporting our black businesses. Now, during that time, another thing that kind of influenced me to start official Black Wall Street um, was the Michael Brown shooting. Um, and during this time, I followed the case, all of the updates, every update you can think of. I followed it all throughout work. I followed it at home, and I was extremely numb. And I felt, I felt helpless, like there was nothing I could do. I went to the marches, I prayed, I tweeted, and I still felt like I wasn't making a movement or I wasn't making you know, a huge impact. And that was when I decided that I was going to start speaking with my money. Amen. Because we've seen that work in the past. We've seen it with the Montgomery bus boycott. We've seen it with different sports boycotts where, you know, if you impact someone's bottom line, that's when they start listening to you. Amen. So that's when I decided to go forth and start speaking with my money and putting my money into places where I know it will be invested back in me and in my people. So, you know, what's great about Maranatha Baptist, Baptist Church doing this is that all of the major movements, the most impactful, powerful movements in the black community, from our fight for emancipation to the civil rights movement, all those movements begin where? Church. In the church, right. So I want you to know that what you're doing is so powerful, and it may not seem as impactful now, but it will be written decades from now. So I commend you all for your efforts to support more black businesses. There are a few things that I've heard people say um, when it comes to not supporting black businesses that I want to address really quickly. Um, one of those is the expense. So you'll find that with a lot of black-owned businesses, some of their prices are a little bit higher than others. And that's because when you have a small business, you don't have the same contracts as other people or the same demands to mass produce your products. So even though Target, or Target, however you like to remix it, can knock down their prices, a new black-owned business will not be able to do so. So it's a catch-22. Unless we support these businesses, they'll never get to the point where they can do the same. 
and will consistently have the cycle of not having wealth in our community. Um, another thing, um, I actually spoken to a brother and sister duo um, in Atlanta, and they have their own grocery store. And I was really excited about this because there are not many black-owned grocery stores in this country. So I was really excited about this. Um, they had been open for less than a year, and then they had to close down. And they were very open and honest about why they had to close. And they said it's because they just couldn't compete. There weren't a lot of people who were actively supporting their businesses. Um, because there was a shop right and the stop shop or stop and shop, um, people would go to those businesses instead of supporting their own. So they had to close down. There were another chain of grocery stores um, in the South. And one by one, those also continued to close down because they could not compete. So when you have these situations where black business owners have to go up against you know, a Walmart or a Target, or you have situations where um, black business owners aren't getting the loans that they need to start black businesses, or even when they do, their interest rates are higher than any other racial group, yeah. it's, it's even more important that we put our support behind these businesses. And the fact of the matter is, when it comes down to it, and when it comes down to things that we're passionate about, you know, when we're marching in the streets and we're demanding justice for something, Target is not going to be there marching with us. Right. So it's important that we put our money, you know, where our interests best lay. Um, and I feel like that's what it will take for us to become a more powerful community, a more wealthy community, and have long-term generational wealth. Um, but clearly we can't do it without everyone pitching in to support. So I challenge you all to, one, go to the Business Expo um, in the next couple of months, and also to look and find as many black-owned businesses as you can to support and move forward with. Because if we don't support ourselves, I have no idea who else will. Amen. Thank you all. Oh, come on, y'all can give our better hand in that. Amen. At this time, we're going to prepare ourselves for the baby dedication, family, those of you who came to support, please come now. Parents and these godparents standing here today making a pledge before you. 
Bless the sacred right now. Do it right now. Have your way now. In Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God say amen. Come on, let's give God a hand of praise in here. We say to you today, parents and godparents, we come today to celebrate this life that God has loaned you. She does not belong to you, but she belongs to God. I simply say this every time, but it's so true. Heaven said, if you bless me a child with a child, Lord, I'll simply give it back to you. As you're standing here as parents, you're making a commitment. As you're standing here as God parents, you're making a commitment. But I say this to you, if you don't know Jesus Christ today, get to know him today. Because parents can testify that are sitting in the pews, if it had not been for the Lord, I wish I had one. I'm going to say it again. If it had not been for the Lord. Come on, look at somebody. Say, if it had not been for the Lord. Some others can testify. If it had not been for the Lord. They didn't know how they was going to put food on the table. So today we say, make that commitment with the Lord. As Reverend Cannon comes today to make that pledge today. Hear what he says. And abide as you stand before God today. Amen. 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 It, it is your intention to uh, bring up this child in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, which you say we do in the following promises. Amen. Amen. Do you hear this day and recognize this child as a gift of God and give heartfelt thanks to God for our blessings? Do you hear this day? This Dedicate this child to the Lord. Do you hear this day pledge as parents that you will bring up this child in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord? Do you hear this day promise to give this child every possible benefit of a home, school, and church? Do you hear this day ask God's blessing upon this child to guide and to guard her for the rest of her days? Amen. Amen. Father God, we come this morning asking you to look down upon this baby, oh God. Lord God, we ask that you keep her, oh God. Keep her safe, oh God. That you surround your angels around her, oh God, that wherever she may go, oh Lord God, the protection and the love will be there. We ask, oh God, that you give the parents, oh God, the wisdom and the knowledge to guide her, oh God, and raise her in the way that you would have her to go, oh God. Lord God, we don't know the plans that you have for her, but you do. Lord God, whether she be a teacher, oh God, whether she be the first black female president, oh God, whatever she may be, oh God, we ask right now that you let her be the best that she can be in your name, oh God. We ask, oh God, that every teacher that feeds into her life, oh God. Every preacher, oh God, that preaches into her life. Every prayer, hand, or word that's spread on her right now, oh God, be with your spirit, oh God. Lord God, we thank you for this child, oh God. We bless your name, oh God. And we anticipate and we expect great things because you only do things greatly. And you are greatly to be praised. We thank you, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, yes. Jesus loves me. That's what she just said right here. Yes, I got you. Jesus. And I had to look at these ugly people too. I understand. <laughs> for the Bible, for the Bible, tell in the name of Jesus. In the 
the name of Jesus. Touch our lives, our God. Yes, Jesus loves me. Come on, give God a praise. All right, what's the baby's name now? Corbin Lee. All right. All right. Now, let's give the future president of the United States a hand. Thank you, parents, God, parents. May God continue to bless you. Amen. We just won't see you. Oh, no. <laughs> Amen. You may return back to your seat. God bless you. Amen. Amen. All right, praise dancers, they ready, right? All right. All right, the praise dancer. All right.
on, look at somebody and say, just stand, just stand. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, look at somebody and say, neighbor, just after all you do all. Everything you can do, just stand some more. Come on, come on, let me suck this. Look at somebody next to you and say, just stand. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Let's give all the chocolate babies a hand this morning. Come on, I know a lot of them ain't here. Everybody's playing hooky, but those that are here, come on, we can do better than that. Hallelujah, somebody. Amen. 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 Thank you. Amen. To the Peter and that liturgical dance. Amen. A job well done. Amen. Then we want to thank our sister Bowen, if I got it right, uh, for stopping by, amen, and giving us that history lesson. And thank you for picking up the mantle and continuing to work. And she gave you some homework to do. Go and study that Black Wall Street. Amen. 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 And see the history. Amen. They dropped the bomb on it. Amen. Stop it to stop all the black businesses. Amen. And they, they got a, a group that they said, you got the, you dropped the bomb on me, baby. And that song was really about what they did in Tulsa, what they did in Oklahoma. Amen, somebody. There's meaning to that song. It ain't about your boo. Amen. 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 And so please, we are going to pray for you. We're going to be behind you 100 percent Amen. Thank you, Deacon Wayne Grant. Thank you, Denise Kennedy. Thank you for all the hard work that you do do. Amen. And it's supporting all the black-owned businesses in Queens. Amen. Come on, get them up in the hand. Amen. 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 Look at somebody and say, neighbor, there was a preacher in the house. Come on, come on. Listen, now, now let me help somebody. Y'all can act like y'all won't be in church all day. Amen. Not me today. Amen. Amen. Listen, I want you to be in your prayer tents as this preacher come. Amen. I think he is one of the greatest preachers in New York. Amen. Amen. Uh, he's on my favorite list. Amen. And as I continue to continue to heal in my own body, he's here to stand in the gap. Amen. And we are going to push him. He don't need that much help. Amen, somebody. Amen. He is somebody's preacher. If you have not heard him, just sit in your tent door, and I guarantee you he'll preach. Amen. All you got to do is just push him. Amen. Amen. And we'll just push him this morning and pray for him. Amen. Just do me a favor. Just lift your hands towards heaven and say, bread of heaven. Come on, come on. Some of you look like you're still home over from last night. Come on, let's get in bed. Say, bread of heaven. Feed me till I walk no more. Come on, bread of heaven. Feed me till I walk no more. Put those hands together in expectation. The words you will hear now, the man of God that stopped here at nine after, the Reverend Dr. Adrian Reed, as he comes. Come on, let's make some noise for him as he comes. Well, this is the day the Lord has made. Amen. We ought to rejoice and we ought to be glad in it. What a mighty God we serve. Yes, Angels bound before him, heaven and earth to adore him. What a mighty God yes, we do serve. If you're grateful to be in God's house today, why don't we give God praise? Because he is indeed worthy of the praise, the glory, and the honor. Somebody said, when I think of the goodness of Jesus, and all that God has done for me. You don't have to think about everything. Just think about one thing. And it ought to cause your soul to break out in praise for what God has done for you. And so to God our Father, Jesus, our elder brother, the Holy Spirit, our comforter and our keeper, to the angel and set man of this house, your pastor, my big brother and friend, the personal pastor, Kim Beach. And come on, let's give God praise for him. Thank God for him. Come on, you can do better than that for your pastor. Give to the body of Christ a genuine brother and a genuine friend. And I thank God for him. And every opportunity he's afforded me to share here with you 
and Maranatha. Y'all know I'm home. So I thank Don for the invitation to come back home uh, today to Reverends Cannon and Samuel and to uh, you, the Lord's people. We greet you with the joy of Jesus. Get your Bibles in your hands. I got 30 minutes and I'm going to get out of your way. If y'all don't mind, I may be able to cut it quicker than 30 minutes. I'm going to try and put that in 30 minutes. Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. I am in love with the parables of Jesus. I have a love when Jesus starts talking. Because you know, whenever you read words in red in the Bible, Jesus said that. Yeah, Jesus, Jesus said that. And I've already preached to you once in coming here about the prodigal son, the younger brother. But today I don't want to talk about that younger brother or the daddy. I want to talk about that elder brother today. So if you don't mind, journey with me to Luke 15, verses 25 through 32. I want to be an encouragement to somebody here. Luke 15, 25 through 32. When you have it, just say, I have it. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. Mine might be slightly different than yours. Nevertheless, it is the word of God. Hear what the word says. Now his older son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. And he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he became angry and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began pleading with him. But he answered and said to his father, Look, for so many years I've been serving you, and I have never neglected a command of yours, and yet you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours, but we had to celebrate and rejoice, for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been found. Thus is the reading of the word of the Lord that has already blessed you. You may be seated in his divine, holy, and sanctified presence. God, we are humbled by this opportunity to share and declare your word. I do not take this moment lightly, nor do I take it for granted. This is not my word. This is your word. These are not my people. These are your people. Do as you please in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. And claim it already done. Amen. <clears throat> and thank God. I want to talk from this subject very quickly. Don't stay outside. That's what I want to preach about today. Don't stay outside. Yes, sir. The story is told of a gardener who grew an enormous carrot. So he took it to his king and said, My lord, this is the greatest carrot that I've ever grown or ever will grow. Therefore, I want to present it to you as a token of my love and my respect for you. The king was touched and discerned the man's heart. So as he turned to go, the king said, Wait. You are clearly a good steward of the earth. I own a plot of land right next to yours. I want to give it to you freely as a gift so that you can garden it all. And the gardener was amazed and delighted and went home rejoicing, y'all. But there was a nobleman at the king's court who overheard all this as well. And he said, my, if that is what you get for a carrot, what if you give this king something better? So the next day the nobleman came before the king and he was leading a handsome black stallion. He bowed low and said, my lord, I breed horses. And this is the greatest horse I've ever bred or ever will breed. Therefore, I want to present it to you as a token of my love and respect for you. But the king discerned his heart and said, thank you, and took the horse and merely dismissed him. The nobleman was perplexed, so the king said, let me explain it to you. That gardener was giving me the carrot, but you were giving yourself the horse. 
That's the gist of our text today. That God is able to discern the hearts of elder brothers. Whether or not what is done is really for him or it is for them. Jesus closes out this one parable containing three different stories within. Uh, and most do not pay attention to the relevance of the elder brother's part in the narrative. They race right through and skip right over missing Jesus' ultimate point. But we must remember, though Jesus is talking to a crowd <clears throat> full of tax collectors and sinners, the Pharisees and the scribes are right there as well. And they are Jesus' target audience. And it is significant to note that while the younger brother represented the tax collectors and the sinners, and the father represented God the Father, that the elder brother represented the Pharisees and the scribes. Therefore, I contend today that there was not just one lost son in the text, but there were rather two yes, lost sons yes, in the text. Yes, one was lost like the sheep was outside, yes. and the other was lost like the coin inside. On, yeah, yeah. I will admit, though, my brothers and my sisters, that the elder brother's part in this narrative caused me greater self-evaluation than the younger brother's part did. The question is not so much, am I like the younger brother as it is, am I like the elder brother? Uh -huh. And all of us should wrestle with this question until uh, we see what lies inside of our own hearts. I believe that if the answer is that we are more like the elder brother, then the reality is that we are actually more like Satan than we are like God. Yes, the good news of the gospel is, however, that we do not have to stay like the elder brother. In other words, brothers and sisters, we don't have to stay outside, but we can come inside and join the party. We can have the opportunity to repent of our self-righteousness and walk in the righteousness that Jesus himself offers to guilty sinners. Three things I need to share with you, and then I'm going to my seat. First point I raise to you today is, that staying outside won't allow you to show grace. Yes, staying outside won't allow you to show grace. That's verses 25 through 29. After the runaway younger brother returns, repents, and is received back as a son with a robe, a ring, sandals, and a party with a fattened calf as the main dish. Look at what happens, y'all. The elder brother is not happy. Uh -huh. He is not happy with the servant's response to him, and then he is not happy when he encounters his own father. The father kept on urging him to come in to the celebration. The sad part is that the elder brother failed to see that the same grace that the younger brother needed is the same grace that he needed as well. My brothers and sisters, Tim Keller uh, would put it this way in his book, uh, The Prodigal God, uh, that the prerequisite for experiencing or receiving the grace of God is to know that you need it. Remember, y'all, the younger son had weakened the family's place in society. He disgraced the family's name. And he diminished the family's wealth. And these are parts of the reason why the elder brother is so mad, y'all. But the elder brother, my brothers and my sisters, also brought shame uh, to the father by way of disrespect. Uh, because first of all, he failed to properly greet his father with either the, fa the title father or sir which insulted the father's dignity. Second, he refused the father's invitation to enter into the party. Third, his words to his father in verses 29 and 30 actually warranted a beating. And any black parent, I don't know about y'all modern parents, but any black parent that's been around any length of time, you understand what the scripture says that if you spare the rod, you will eventually spoil the child. And I think that's a good place to drop anchor right quick because we just had a baby dedication and maybe the parents here today need to quite understand uh, that you, you got to train these children the right way. Uh, you, 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 don't, you don't need to be your child's friend. They can be your friend when they're paying some bills around the house. 
They can be your friend when they got grown, when they out the house, all that stuff. But while they're in your house, they need to have a level of respect for you, and you need to whoop them before the popo whoop them. So, he, he warranted a beating by way of disrespect. He obviously forgot to ask an elder brother his job was actually to reconcile differences between the father and the younger brother and not to be the cause of the problem. But I believe, y'all, that jealousy got in the way of him acting as an elder brother should. Look at his complaint to his father. One, I have served you all these years. Two, I never disobeyed any of your commands. Three, you never even gave me a kid, let alone a fattened calf. And four, I wanted to celebrate with my friends too. Can't you see the root of the problem, y'all? It wasn't genuine love for the father that the elder brother had. It was love for the father's things that the elder brother had. And if he could have had the father's things without having the father, he would have been content. And how many of us only serve God for what he can give to us and not for who he is and what he's already given to us? The elder brother was more like a slave being forced and being pushed than he was like a son being drawn and being attracted. And can I tell you, if you come to church Sunday after Sunday and the only reason why you're here is because of what you can get from God, you might as well walk away from God right now. Because can I burst your bubble real quick? You ain't always going to get what you expect. Every now and then God will let the bottom fall out and all hell break loose in your life to let you realize that your reliance can't be on God's things. Your reliance has got to be on God. And is there anybody here today that's matured to a place that you don't just want the things of God, but you want the God of the things? So, this other brother based his relationship with the father on his work and not on his love. Second thing I see in the text is not only was staying outside not allowing you to show grace, but secondly, staying outside will cause you to have to check your heart. That's in verse number 30, y'all. This, dear friends, demonstrates the elder brother spirit. Come on now. Yes. What in the world yes. is the elder brother spirit, you ask? Well, the elder brother spirit, y'all, is a spirit of pride. In Luke chapter number 18, verse number 9, at the opening of the parable of the Pharisee and the publican, Luke gives the greatest definition of the elder brother spirit because he says, this is what Jesus says actually, Jesus says, and he also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. The elder brother spirit, y'all, is not just a spirit, but it is more so sin. You know, we don't use that three-letter word in church no more. Because we don't want to offend nobody. We don't want to make nobody mad. But uh, the Bible and the word of God in and of itself is an offense. Because if you really read scripture, you ought to be offended. You ought to be offended by your nasty lifestyle. You ought to be offended when you read the word of God and realize how much God loves you, but yet we continue to sin against God. And brothers and sisters, this elder brother, uh, it, it, he had this spirit. He uh, elevated his religious goodness over irreligious badness. Here are some signs that you just might be an elder brother. Come on now. <laughs> and have an elder brother spirit first when you see everyone else as a sinner and not yourself you my friend have an elder brother spirit when you are moral but only for your own benefit you my friend have an elder brother spirit when self centeredness is really masked by unselfishness. You, my friend, have an elder brother spirit. When you work for God out of fear and not out of joy, you, my friend, have an elder brother spirit. When you become angry and bitter, 
consider that life ain't going your way. You, my friend, have an elder brother spirit. And lastly, when you try to control God by your obedience to his word, you, my friend, have an elder brother spirit. Tim Keller says further that as long as you're trying to earn your salvation by controlling God through your goodness, you will never be sure that you have been good enough for him. But I believe, y'all, that the elder brother, hear this. Wow. For those of you that may have looked at the text but never seen it the way I saw it. Uh -huh. I believe, y'all, that the elder brother uh -huh. secretly wanted to live the life that his younger brother lived. Yeah. Notice the contempt and the sarcasm of his response to his father because he said, this son of yours. Where well, he totally dismisses and disregards the younger brother as even being his brother. Uh -huh. Now, he obviously knew that the younger brother blew his inheritance. But what makes me scratch my head and question uh, what he says is this. How in the world did he know that the younger brother blew it on prostitutes? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Whenever you read scripture, you need to speculate. So in my speculative mind, here's some things that I came up with. Unless, y'all, the elder brother was there in the far country spying on him or he secretly spent his own money on prostitutes or he would have done the same thing had he been in his younger brother's shoes. How in the world could he know what the younger brother had done? James Montgomery Boyce says that we are never so like God as when we rejoice at the salvation of sinners. Then he says that we are never so like Satan as when we despise those who are thus converted and think ourselves to be superior to them. The elder brother y'all thought that because he never left, thought that because he never disobeyed, and thought that because he did everything right, that he was better than his younger brother. But beware, yo, though, that a blameless outward actions are not really masking an evil inward attitude. Well, friends, I contend, I contend that the elder brother who stayed at home was more distant, yes. was more alienated, yes. and was further from the father than his younger brother who left because he trusted in his own righteousness and in his own goodness. Can I show y'all something? Yes. The coin in verses 8 through 10 and the elder brother in verses 25 through 32 demonstrate that it is altogether possible to be lost in the house. Yes. They demonstrate that it is altogether possible to come to church Sunday after Sunday and not really know Jesus. They demonstrate that it is possible to go to church and still go to hell. And there are many people that are going to bust hell wide open because they never have a relationship with the God of the church and the God of the Bible. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. And can I drop something in your lap today? Don't you be that kind of believer. Don't be an unbelieving believer. You better be a believer all day, every day, because Jesus died so that you could live. Tim Keller says further that sin is not just breaking all the rules. It is really putting yourself in the place of God as Savior, Lord, and Judge. Can I give you my definition of sin? Here's my definition of sin. Sin, y'all, is dethroning God and enthroning self. Come on, come on. It seeks to switch the roles between you and God. But this means, y'all, that you can rebel and be alienated from the Father by breaking or by keeping all the rules. All right. By being very bad or by being very good. By being very sensual or by being very ethical. By leaving or by staying. By rebelling or by working. This means, y'all, further that the elder brother or rather elder brother lostness is just as wrong and destructive as younger 
brother lostness. Don't think because you've been in church for a long period of time that make you better than somebody else. Hey, hey, thank you, brother. Thank you. I done met some of the meanest and most disgusting in hey. the I wish I could say it like I want to, but I'm in church. I can't, I can't use those four letter words like I really want to. And I ain't talking about y'all. I'm just talking about what I'm talking about, as my grandmother would say. I done been to more than enough churches where I know what the real deal is. Grew up in a church with a bunch of mean and surly and hateful old folk that were just mean. I don't know. I don't know if they were just mad because they were getting old, which I thought we should celebrate uh, getting old because that means the Lord has let you live for a long period of time. I really never understood what the problem was. And can I tell y'all something? Uh, one of the reasons why young folk won't come to church is some of, some of the mean old folk in church. Don't nobody want to deal with your mean, nasty self. You all looking like you got egg on your face, like you've been sucking on lemon juice all day. That's a problem. You better straighten up and fly right. Salvation ought to come with some joy. In other words, y'all, Nehemiah 8 and 10 at the close of the verse, Nehemiah says that the joy of the Lord is my strength. But I put this up on Facebook the other day because not only is the joy of the Lord my strength, but the strength of the Lord is my joy. When I should have snap crackled and popped, it was the strength of the Lord that kept me from snap crackling and popping. And if you've been on the Lord's side for a long period of time, you ought to have some joy. So each one's a dead end, y'all. It's not a matter of one's deeds for God, but rather God's love for them that determines their position in God. That's right, that's right. That's right. This is why Jesus is the only way to salvation. Third thing, I'm out. Not only was staying outside, not allowing you to show grace, not only was staying outside cause you to check your heart. Last thing I need to share with you is that staying outside, I'm doing good. Got 11 minutes okay. left. Have a new year, God. <laughs> and I'm at my last point. Look at the Lord, because I know I can smell the burgers on it. There's not much I get excited over. Food and my lady. Praise the Lord. Thank God. Lord. Hallelujah. The last thing is staying outside will cause you to miss the celebration. Yeah. Yeah. That's in verses 31 and 32. The truth of the matter is, y'all, there is hope uh -huh. even for Pharisees. Wow. Come on, help them, help them. Yes. <laughs> yes. There's hope yeah. help them. even for Pharisees, but there must be, oh, let me break that word Pharisee down for you. Pharisee, they, they're far, 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 far. Right. They're so far, can't you see? They thought that because they were religious, they were closer to God. But the reality is they were the furthest thing from God. Because they despised and they looked down on the dejected and the people that Jesus came to save. He came to seek and to save the least, the last, and the lost. You got to be cautious of looking down on people because they don't look like you or smell like you or think like you or act like you. The reality is you ain't God, so you don't have a monopoly on who God saves. Here's the better one. He saved you, didn't he? Yeah. And I ain't even got to come down your street. I can stay right on my street. I know what I was. I know what I am. And he still decided to save me and use me to declare his gospel. God doesn't call us because we're perfect. He calls us because we're being perfected. In other words, he still has us on the wheel. And he's still making, shaping, molding us into what he wants us to be. And is there anybody here that can thank God that God still has you on the wheel? I started not to preach this. I really did not want to preach this morning. I started to preach something totally different. I was flipping through. Uh, if y'all saw me every now and then, when you see me flipping through my iPad, that's me trying to get out of the message that the Lord gave me to preach. But I see why he wanted me to preach this today because somebody needs to hear of this word and be encouraged. You need not stay outside. There's some sinner here today that don't know who Jesus is. You don't want to miss the pot. Yeah, do, do you remember that song? Who was it on um, uh, Real Housewives of Atlanta? Um, <laughs> Kim, 
Yeah, Kim Zosiak. Um, yeah. She had that song that said, no, yeah, I watch, I, every night that I watch that stuff. She said, don't be caught in. For the party. And, and, and that's the gist of the text here today. Don't be tardy for the party. Don't miss out on the party. And everybody in here knows about a party. Don't you get in here and get super spiritual and sanctimonious on me today. Because some of y'all party last night. Some of y'all about to party tonight. And the party ain't going to be over till sometime tomorrow. Yes, yeah, some of y'all gonna be partying tomorrow, and so you know, and I know I'm in the right house to know about parties, amen. We ain't let one of them sedity, I like this church, because y'all ain't sedity and up with it. Thank y'all for now, I can't stand churches like that, act like they don't do nothing, no wrong. You, listen, you know about a party. Yeah, I know. This, this, this elder brother, uh-huh. Go ahead. Wanted to miss the party. Yeah. I don't care how mad I am, I ain't about to miss. The party, but y'all, there must be an acknowledgement of sin and the need for repentance. Tim Keller says further, to truly become Christians, we must also, hear this, repent of the reasons we ever did anything right. Uh, oh, come on. He says, Pharisees only repent of their sins, but Christians repent of the very roots of their righteousness as well. Right. See, sometimes you need to check your heart. Uh-huh. Am I really doing this for God? Or am I doing this for me? The words lost and found, y'all, are always metaphors for sin and salvation. All right. Pharisees and elder brothers do not have to stay lost because they can be found as well. This means that elder brother, uh, elder brothers should not be angry about younger brothers' return and celebration of the way that the Pharisees and scribes should not have been angry about Jesus' reception and fellowship with the tax collectors and the sinners. But sadly, y'all, just like the elder brother who refused to go into the feast, the Pharisees and the scribes refused to enter into God's kingdom. The bad son, who is a picture of the younger son, uh, enters the father's feast, but the good son. Now, Jesus kind of leaves us with a cliffhanger. Uh-huh. Come on now. Because to be honest with you, y'all, we don't know what ended up happening. That's right. We don't know if the elder brother actually went in or if the elder brother kept on saying ah. We don't know. My belief uh-huh. is that the elder brother eventually went in, yeah. but the problem is he still stayed outside too long. All right, come on. And that's a representation of the Jews even now that still don't believe yeah. that Jesus is the look for Messiah. Yeah. You can go up the block a little bit and they got a little area over there where they they waiting on his return. Y'all done missed it. He done came and he's on his way back again. The story therefore ends, y'all, with him staying in his alienated state. Even though he had the opportunity to repent, this completely reversed everything the Pharisees and scribes had been taught. Jesus is really saying to elder brothers and Pharisees, don't stay outside. Instead, come in and enjoy the party. He is saying to elder brothers and Pharisees, don't assume that your good works is what it takes to earn salvation and to get into heaven. Because of the reality is you cannot work your way into the presence of God no Come on, man. you gotta have been graced with this thing All right. yeah because Ephesians chapter 2 would argue that it's by grace uh-huh. that you and I have been saved and it's true faith uh-huh. <laughs> yeah it's a gift of God it's not of ourselves not of works lest any man should boast but that's why whatever you think about your good works, yeah. you better think about God's grace. Because right. the good news of salvation is that God's grace is sufficient. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the elder brother and therefore the Pharisees, y'all, did not realize the position. I got three minutes, 53 seconds to go. The position that they had already. When the Father says that you are always with me, and that everything I have is yours. What Jesus is really saying is that they already were privileged to be members 
of God's chosen people. But the sad part, y'all, that wasn't enough for them. Yeah, the problem that they had is they did not really have a relationship with the Father. That's right. Come on now. Yeah. And can I tell y'all today that you need to have a relationship with the Father. Yeah. It's not enough to come to church Sunday after Sunday. Yeah. You got to have a relationship with the Lord. But the good news of salvation is that salvation is always depicted as a feast. Yeah, that's why the feast of the founder represents the great feast at the end of history. Because Revelation 19 talks about the great feast that we will encounter. And Jesus is saying that if you don't stay outside, you can enjoy the feast. And the feast has entertainment. The feast has dancing. The feast has the best food that was especially saved for an occasion like this. And who would not want to join a party like that? Yeah, I don't know about you, but whenever I go to a party, I'll go and tell you, uh, I'm not really there for the dancing. Uh-huh. Come on, now, the yeah, I ain't really there for the entertainment, yeah, yeah, the but I am there for the food. Yeah, uh, yeah and if you got a good spread in front of me, yeah. you got my attention for the whole night. Yeah. And can I tell y'all today that you don't want to be like the elder brother? You don't want to miss the party that Jesus will throw for a believer. And is there anybody here that wants to be a part of the party of God? You want to be at the celebration at the end of eternity. My brothers and my sisters, you don't want to be like the foolish virgins in Matthew 25. But I want to be a part of the celebration because I discovered that the fattened calf is a picture of Jesus. My brothers and my sisters have the fattened calf not been slaughtered totally and completely. There could be no celebration. Therefore, in order for the younger brother to be alive again and to even allow the older brother to have the opportunity for eternal life. The fattened calf had to be killed. And my brothers and my sisters, the good news of the gospel is in order for you and I to be able to sit at Jesus' table at the end of history, Jesus had to die for you me and to say anybody here that can give God praise that he died for you so you don't have to stay outside you can come inside and the song says oh I want to see him look upon his face there to see forever of his saving grace on the streets of glory let me lift the Lord from cares all past Oh man, last ever to rejoice. Is there anybody that wants to see Jesus face to face in all of his glory, in all of his splendor, in all of his majesty? I know you've been shouting about cribs, cars, cash, clothes, creature comforts. And commodities, but I shout about the Christ because Christ has made the difference in my life, and that's why when I get to heaven, I don't want to see my grandmama and my granddaddy. I'll come back to y'all later, but I want to see the man who died for me. Is there anybody here? Wants to see uh, the man uh, that died for you. Uh, his name uh, is Jesus. Uh, Waymaker. Uh, Jesus.
started calling his name. And uh, I know your boo's name gets you excited. And I thank God for my lady, but here's why. Her name don't excite me as much as Jesus because she didn't die for me. And even if she could have died for me, the problem is it wouldn't have secured salvation. But in Jesus dying for me, it purchased my salvation. And somebody here today ought to praise Jesus. Well, you don't have to stay outside. You can come in and be a part of the party. Can I tell you something else about a party? I don't do much dancing, but... It ain't polite to go to a party. If they put on the electric slide, I'm out there. Okay. I'm still trying to learn all these other ones, you know. I ain't got them down back yet, but they put that on, I'm out there. It's not polite to go to a party and not that. And since Jesus has done something for you, some of y'all make more noise at Shea Stadium, excuse me, uh, uh, what's the new stadium? City Field, I think it's way back now. City Field and Barclays and, 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 and Madison Square Garden and now Nassau Coliseum looking as nice as this looking now. Uh, you, you make more noise there than you do in church, but uh, anybody that hits a home run ain't hitting a home run for your salvation. Anybody that gets a slam dunk ain't getting a slam dunk for your salvation. Anybody that scores a touchdown ain't scoring a touchdown for your salvation. But Jesus hit a home run, scored a touchdown, and hit a slam dunk over 2017 years ago for your salvation. And can I see those that don't mind praising him today? So what he did for you? Salvation ought to come with joy. And if you hear that, and your life has been without joy, can I give you some joy today? Get to know Jesus. And don't misinterpret what I'm saying to you. You are not going to live on a bed of roses. Your life is not going to be perfect now that you've come on the Lord's side. You're going to still have trials and testings. But why would you not have trials and testings? You can't get 
grape juice unless you crush a grape. You can't get oil unless you crush an olive. And you can't get the genuineness of a believer unless that believer is crushed as well. God never crushes to kill. God crushes to heal. I am the Lord that healeth thee. I am the Lord your healer. Send my word to heal your disease. I am the Lord your healer. If you're here today, don't, don't get saved just because you don't want to die and go to hell. Get saved because he's pulling and tugging at your heart. This is a heart thing. But don't let it just stay at your heart. It needs to be a head thing too. Anybody that's saved only in their heart and not in their head, you got a bad salvation. Because the devil will always be able to box you upside the head if you keep on going based on how you feel. Salvation has to transverse from feeling to knowing. I just said something right there. I know. I don't just feel this thing. I know this thing. And if you hear that, I offer Jesus to you. Doors of the church are open. He's the greatest thing that will ever happen to you. If anyone should ever write my life story, tell them Jesus is the best thing that ever happened to me. If you're here, come. Don't look around you at nobody else. Let me encourage you. You, you, you stand to walk up because people going to be looking at you. Man, block them out. And here's why you need to block them out. Because none of them got a heaven and hell to put you in. And nobody is beyond the reach of God. Look at how messed up your life may be. You are not too far from God that he can't save you. He saved me. I ain't even got to talk about no. I don't know nobody else's story. I know my story. But I told y'all before, I didn't do my sinning before I started preaching. Because I started preaching at 10. I didn't know much about sin at 10 years old. I found out after the fact about sin. Stuff that I didn't know nothing about when I was a little kid. But the Lord still used me in spite of. I ain't looking for you to be perfect. He can clean you up. You talking about I'm going to wait if I can get myself together. Here's the problem. You'll never get yourself together. If you're here, you ought to come while you can. Give your life to him. Magnitude of gift given is just not about the gift that's given to. The person that God has given this gift of salvation to is you. That means God thinks a whole lot about you. That he would give you his darling son, Jesus Christ. If you're here, he'll give you brand new life. If you're here, learn above. Y'all know that. If you're here, come. So come. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, you ought to come to Christ. Uh, and everybody lift your voice. You might encourage somebody. You know, sometimes people are enticed by music. So let's sing that and lift our voice, everybody. We all for Christ to you, say, We all to you. Oh, my brother. If you're here today, you want to come. We we all for Christ to you. Oh, my sister. It didn't exclude the women. You in there too. He will give. Oh, yeah. He'll give you brand new life. Life abundantly. So, so come. Hey, yeah. Come on. Run that so come. So hold You, you want to come to death.
I still got to be the best. Hell, amen. Come on, let's give it up for her. Amen. So good to see you, my brother. Looking good. Amen. Amen. Good to see some of the hell family. Amen. 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 God bless you. Amen. Reach out and touch somebody across the aisle. Amen. Thank mm-hmm. you. 